You have the floor, Mr. Mo. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues. Confronting the global pollution crisis and its adverse impacts on human rights demands information on critical questions concerning emissions and the disposal of hazardous wastes. What pollutants and wastes are emitted or disposed of? Where? In what quantities? By whom? And with what consequences? These are all decisive questions, and pollution information portals can help answer them. In doing so, these portals contribute to good environmental governance, corporate accountability, and the sustainable development goals. While their specific features vary, first-generation portals are online public platforms that provide data on the emissions and wastes from industrial and business activities, among others. By contrast, new generation portals are entryways to information that allow users to transform data into knowledge. But not all countries have them, and where these portals do exist, some exhibit shortcomings that hinder their effectiveness. The importance of pollution information portals can be appreciated from the perspective of their users. Environmental regulators at the national level need this information to assess risks, set priorities, and create and improve regulations and policies. Authorities also need this information for proper enforcement of laws and regulations. Individuals and communities also need this information to participate meaningfully in decisions on prevention, reduction, and control of pollution. This information is also essential to understand actual risks, take preventive action, and secure adequate remedies. Businesses can also use this information to safeguard a level playing field. Businesses should not be allowed to derive a competitive market advantage from externalizing toxic risks and harms on communities. Several international agreements contemplate pollution information portals to advance the right to a healthy environment. The Escazú Agreement in Latin America and the Caribbean and the Aarhus Convention, negotiated under the UN Economic Commission for Europe, both require the respective parties to take steps towards establishing registries on pollutant releases and the transfer of wastes. Under Aarhus, the Kyiv Protocol is wholly dedicated to pollutant release and transfer registries. Similarly, the 2023 Global Framework on Chemicals for a planet free of harm from chemicals and wastes recommends states to establish pollution information portals. Given this landscape, this tool offers important avenues and opportunities for international assistance, especially north-south cooperation. Mr. Vice President, 40 years ago this year, Thousands of people lost their lives when toxic gas was released from a pesticide manufacturing facility controlled by an American corporation in Bhopal, India. Many more have died or become disabled to, due to the massive pollution released from the site of the facility. The area has become a sacrifice zone and the victims are still struggling for justice. In the aftermath of the tragedy in Bhopal, communities across the United States mobilized to get the US Congress to adopt a Right to Know Act, which established a toxic release inventory. This inventory was inspired by the only national pollutant registry that existed at the time in the Netherlands. Since then, many industrialized countries have adopted pollutant release and transfer registries, but only a handful of developing countries have done so. In my extensive consultations leading to this year's thematic report, civil society organizations and others from all over the world stressed how pollution information portals are vital tools for pollution prevention, not only 
in rich countries. They highlighted time and again the need for accurate, timely, and actionable information on toxic releases in order to secure the effective enjoyment of human rights harmed by pollution. Mr. Vice President, there are various types of pollution information portals. Some have a distinct geographic coverage, such as supranational, regional, or national scope. Some others monitor general environmental quality at the local and national level, or specific emissions and wastes regulated by global treaties. But regardless of their scope, robust pollution information portals exhibit key elements of design and implementation that enable their users to advance pollution prevention policies. Here are three examples of good practices. Firstly, robust pollution information portals clearly lay out their purpose of preventing and or reducing pollution. Otherwise, the lack of a clear pollution prevention and reduction mandate can have the unintended effect of normalizing pollution, encouraging a misplaced sense of complacency and confusing means and ends. Secondly, robust portals address both point and diffuse sources. With regard to point sources, such as facilities, portals handle data reported by regulated activities, including measurements of pollutants released and wastes transferred. With regard to diffuse sources, such as from the use of products in transportation and agriculture, portals handle data on the basis of estimates that are derived from approved methodologies. Thirdly, robust pollution information portals are user-friendly. They provide easy to understand summaries and visualizations to enhance public understanding of environmental impacts and trends. And they engage stakeholders and right holders in the design, implementation, and review of the information system. While these features define robust portals, some models exhibit certain gaps that limit their full potential. Here are three examples. First is the limited or non-mandatory reporting by businesses, where reporting is voluntary or where it is not comprehensive, portals are unable to fully deliver. For example, most countries collecting or estimating data on diffuse sources do not account for pollution from consumer products. Second is the limited substance coverage. Portals focus their coverage on a list of substances, which often include major greenhouse gases, acid rain pollutants, ozone depleting substances, heavy metals, polychlorinated biphenyls, volatile organic compounds, and dioxins. However, portals may not always capture substances of emerging concern. For example, PFAS, so-called forever chemicals, nanomaterials or microplastics are often not reported. Third and last is the limited public awareness and participation. For example, the use of overly technical language or the lack of explanation of the hazardous properties of substances creates distance between portals and the public. To conclude, Mr. Vice President, establishing and maintaining pollution information portals is a key element of due diligence in confronting environmental risks and discharging human rights obligations concerning hazardous substances. This is because actionable information on hazardous emissions and wastes is critical to effectively prevent, reduce, and control pollution. Many countries have set up pollution information portals, and many others have committed to doing so in international agreements. Still, much remains to be done. We need concrete steps to be taken to secure a toxic-free environment for all. 
given the wealth of knowledge that has accrued with the experience of many countries and organizations over the past few decades, there is ample opportunity for international assistance and cooperation in this area. Therefore, I wish to conclude this part by calling on states in a position to do so to support others in establishing and maintaining pollution information portals. Mr. Vice President, now I wish to say a few words about my visits to South Africa and Australia. Starting with South Africa, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the government of South Africa for the invitation to conduct a visit and for the excellent cooperation. South Africa has championed the right to a healthy environment, enshrining it 25 years before the General Assembly in its constitution with landmark judgments by domestic courts to enforce it. Despite important steps nationally and internationally, the crude legacy of pre-1994 environmental racism persists. The negative socioeconomic, health, and environmental impacts of toxic pollution from mining, coal-fired power plants, greenhouse gas-intensive projects, landfills, pesticides, and other hazardous substances disproportionately affect marginalized and low-income communities along racial lines. Outdated laws predating 1994 and inadequate enforcement exacerbate these circumstances. The rights to information, public participation, and an effective remedy are embedded in the laws and environmental policies. Nonetheless, information on hazardous substances and pollution is often lacking or inaccessible. Public participation processes are widely perceived as a box-ticking exercise, and violations by polluters are often left unchecked. Looking forward, I note South Africa's efforts to address toxic challenges, including establishing the Just Transition Framework, instituting new regulations, for example, governing pesticides, and strengthening enforcement cap capacities. I welcome efforts in this direction and reiterate my offer for technical support. On Australia, I sincerely thank the government of Australia for the invitation to undertake a visit and for its excellent cooperation. I commend Australia for its leading role in important initiatives related to toxics and waste at the national at the in, and the international levels. The next step is for Australia to incorporate the right to a healthy environment into domestic federal law. After my visit, I welcome the news that the Australian Capital Territory enshrined this right in law, and I urge legislators in all other jurisdictions to follow. I remain concerned that the toxic impacts of coal mines and coal-fired power plants, uranium mines, hazardous pesticides, radioactive waste, PFAS substances and waste incineration projects pose serious threats to the environment and to the health of affected communities. In many instances, there is no legal obligation for states and territories to translate environmental standards and regulations agreed upon nationally into their laws, resulting in gaps and uneven implementation across the country's jurisdictions. Human rights must be the touchstone to guide Australia's transformation of law and policy on toxics, including to secure respect for the rights of indigenous peoples. I very much look forward to continued engagement with the government of Australia in the coming years. In this regard, I reiterate my offer of technical assistance. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Orellana.